I wanted to tell you um, some more about proteases, which are protein scissors. Um, so basically they can take a protein, which is the long chain of amino acids, um, that gets all folded up all nicely um, to form a functional protein. And what they do is they come in and basically act as scissors and they come in and they break this apart. And so proteases have a bunch of uses that we've talked about, and so protease inhibitors have a bunch of uses that we talked about, but how is this actually happening? Like, how is, like, obviously they're not like actual scissors going around and cutting things. So how are these molecular scissors formed? And once we know how the scissors are formed, we can then take advantage of knowing how they form to inhibit them if we don't want them to be acting, like to inhibit the generic proteases that are, um, like kind of everywhere and especially like when we're doing like a protein purification we don't want them like chewing up our proteins so we can add generic protease inhibitors to stop those but we add a cocktail so we have different types to inhibit the different um types of um types of proteases um we also have like specific protease inhibitors such as pfizer's paxlovid drug um which inhibits the mpro which is a protease that the vi the coronavirus makes um, and that allows it to cut its um, long, cut a long chain of proteins that it makes, the polyprotein, into individual active um, proteins. So the inhibitor stops that, um, stops the virus from being able to um, cut apart its proteases, um, or cut apart its proteins um, to make functional. Uh, cut apart its polyprotein to make functional individual proteins. Um, so I'll tell more about those various examples, but first let's understand how these blades, these blades really are formed. Proteins, as I mentioned, are long chains of amino acids, which are like individual letters. So you can see there's this kind of like repeating backbone. So it has this like peptide backbone and these are strong peptide bonds and all the amino acids have the same generic um, backbone part so they can connect up this way. And then once they're joined together, they, they have their unique parts sticking out. So these unique parts are called side chains or R groups. And so there are 20 different commonly, common um, genetically encoded amino acids. Um, and basically they all have that generic backbone so they can link up, but the, and, they, and that's the backbone that's gonna get cut by these proteases. But then they also have these unique side chains that stick out. And so you can see like some of them are long um, and some of them are charged, some of them are like, don't be, like to be water, by water, some of them do. Um, and so basically when the protein folds up, it folds up in a way that accommodates the different side chains of the different amino acids. And when it does this, so and you have an enzyme like our protease that um, is going to actually do the cutting. So most of the protein is actually there to kind of like give the protease its shape and make sure it folds correctly and it can do other things like interact with other stuff but basically the active site so where those scissor blades are is actually happening in like a, just like a certain pocket so the whole protein is important uh, or at least like the part around it and stuff for making sure it folds properly and, and it can do everything it's supposed to do but the active site the part where the like the substrate so the thing to be cut like the peptides gonna bind is going to be just like a site. And so the things that stick out into the site, the amino acid residues that stick out are going to be able to um, both contribute to why specific substrates bind, as well as contribute to the mechanism of how the um, they are going to cut. Um, and so in serine or threonine or cysteine proteases or glutamate or aspartate or whatever, you're going to have that, that, that name comes from the amino acid residue that's sticking out into the active site and helping with the catalysis or the speeding up, the catalyzing of this cleavage of the peptide. And so by residue, what I mean, um, so basically when amino, amino acids are called amino acids because on one end they have a ami free amino group and on the other end they have a free um, carboxylic acid group. They link, when they link up, they join together those groups. And so now you, so this came from what was an amino group. This came from what was a carboxylic acid group, but now you don't um, have those. Instead, all that's left behind is the residue. Um, so basically, we often refer to residues as um, like, or inner amino acids, we sometimes use them interchangeably, but technically it's the residue that's left over. And it's the side chain of this residue that's the unique part that's going to be, that can contribute to um, the catalytic action, um, as well as, well, the backbone can 
form like hydrogen bonding and stuff too so the backbone's really important um but in these cases what we're looking at is interactions with the actual side chains that are sticking out so there are different types of proteases and peptidases and we can classify them um, broadly based on where they cut. So endoproteases are, um, they cut in the middle of the chain. Exoproteases are kind of like chewing from an end. We can also, this is what happens when you're in the lab alone, morning bird. Um, so then um, we can also classify based on how they cut. So some of them, as we talked about, like the serine and the cysteine proteases, they do their own cutting and they do it in two steps with covalent intermediates. So you have the one step where half of it gets released and half of it's stuck on to the scissors. And then the, the other half, the water comes in and releases this and resets everything. In other cases, you have um, different types where you actually, you activate a water molecule and the water molecule is going to do the cutting for you. Um, and so it's not gonna get stuck on. Um, so yeah, so basically these ones with the covalent intermediates, these are serine proteases, cysteine proteases, and threonine proteases. And they all act pretty similarly, um, but with cysteine proteases, we'll see you, you typically just need like a dyad. Um, so you need, instead of like a catalytic triad, we'll get into these terms, don't worry. Um, others act, um, sorry, what you might see about these that they have in common is they have, um, so these serine and threonine have a hydroxyl or an OH group and cysteine has a thiol or an SH group. Basically, what's going to happen is these can um, get activated into strong nucleophiles, and what these are going to do is these are going to attack. This is the same, similar to having an, just a free floating hydroxyl, so an OH minus group attacking, um, which is what how the water works. And so, as we'll see, basically you can activate these by pulling off a hydrogen, um, giving, making these negatively charged and um, having this lone pair of electrons that can then go attack. And so with these proteases, it's coming directly from the amino acid, whereas others are going to activate water to do that. So they're going to pull a proton off of water and then water is going to do the attacking. And so some of these, um, in order to activate that water, so now you're activating the water instead of activating the amino acid, um, this can be done if by like aspartic protease proteases use like an aspartate residue, glutam glutamic proteases use a glutamate, and metalloproteases are going to use a metal ion to help. And we'll get into this in more specifics. Um, so a couple of the, just a little bit of terminology that's going to help. Um, so basically we can, atoms are made up of, atoms are made up of, Basically, molecules are made up of atoms. Um, so there's like individual carbons, hydrogens, nitrogens. And those are made up of smaller parts called subatomic particles. Um, I have a video on all of this, um, so it might help to understand. So I'm just gonna kind of whiz through and just refresh people's minds if they've forgotten or if they don't know this. Um, but basically, atoms are made up of these subatomic particles. So in their core, they have a central core where it has positively charged protons and neutral neutrons. Um, and then surrounding that positive core is this cloud of electrons, which are these negatively par charged um, particles. And so the proton's job is to kind of help rein those electrons in with the positive negative charge traction. Um, but the electrons, especially the ones on the outer edge, the valence electrons, they're really wanting to get free. And so they're kind of roaming about. Um, and the, they can actually join up with other atoms in order and to form covalent bonds. So atoms can share pairs of electrons to form covalent bonds. And these are the strong bonds. So these are the bonds that make up molecules. Like these are these kind of bonds. Then you can also have like attractions. So we call those covalent bonds. So those would be like covalent interactions or um, covalent bonding when we have the covalent like intermediates. You can also have non-covalent bonding. And basically, instead of being like linked together, it would be like this. So they're, they're maybe like attracted to each other, but they're not, these aren't linked together. So they're attracted to each other, but they're not linked together. And so they're often attracted through like partial charge attractions um, because that those electrons 
what they're they're whizzing about in this like cloud. And if you have, and the protons are stuck there in the center. So if you have this cloud like a, being drawn in like more towards one, the electrons are hanging out more in one direction, then you're going to get this separation of charge, even though overall the molecule is neutral. So we call this like polarity. Um, but basically the idea is that you can have different regions of like partial charge in the molecule in addition to having like full charges, which we call ions. Um, and so with these charge attractions, um, then you can get these non-covalent interactions that can play a role in helping um, determine like peptide sub um, specificity and stuff based on like what amino acids are hanging out into that active site. And we're also going to see actual um, charge products in our active site. Um, one more term that you need, uh, one more little quick terminology is its idea of nucleophiles and electrophiles. So basically, as I mentioned, um, atoms can share pairs of electrons to form bonds. Um, they also have like lone pairs of electrons. And we call molecules that, so some molecules have like more electrons that they can comfortably handle. We call these nucleophiles because they want another nucleus. So the nucleus is where protons are, remember? So they want another nucleus and that's more protons to help, sh help them share the burden of those electrons. So you can't share protons. The protons are what define an element. Like the number of protons defines the element. So carbon always has six protons, nitrogen always has seven, oxygen always has eight. If they have a different number, they'd be a different element. So you can't share the protons, but you can share pairs of electrons. And you can share the burden of like having this ele extra electron electrons or this electron density. And so these molecules that have more electrons than they can comfortably handle, we call these nucleophiles. And they're going to seek out electrophiles, which are things that want more electrons. Um, and so you can get a nucleophile to attack an electrophile. And this is what we are going to see in our um, example or in our proteases. One more thing to know is that oxygen is very, it's very electronegative. So when we talk about that cloud of electrons, the oxygen is going to be hogging the electrons in that shared cloud. So when it's like sharing electrons with hydrogens and water, it's, it's hogging them. So it's going to be um, electro, it's going to be um, partly negative and the rest is partly positive. It's also going to pull away from the, it's also going to pull away from the um, carbon in a carbonyl. So a carbonyl is where you have a um, C double bonded to an oxygen. And the oxygen here is going to be pulling away, making this partly negative and this partly positive, similarly to what we saw in the water. OK, so this is going to make this um, carbon electrophilic. And so we have, we're going to see that we're going to have a nucleophilic attack of this carbon. And our nucleophile, so remember, that's the thing that's going to want to attack um, because it wants to seek out some positivity. The nucleophile is going to be coming from um, a depro or from the yeah, deprotonated um, hydroxyl or thiol group. So an OH um, or a, um, so an OH, um, so with the serine, you'll have like an O minus with the and the threonine, you'll have a O minus. With the water, you'll have an OH minus. And with the um, cysteine, you'll have an S minus. Um, so let's take a look at how these um, proteases work now that we have this kind of like basic terminology underway. So with the serine protease, at its heart is this catalytic triad. So by catalysis, so catalysis is like the speeding up of reactions. Um, and so, a catalyst, so enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up reactions, but they don't get changed in the process. They don't get like used up in the process. So at the end of the cycle, the, pro the enzyme is like back to normal. Um, so with the serine protease, the active, so the really, sh the blades of the scissors is the serine. But the serine needs help. Um, and it's going, because the OH is not a very good um, nucleophile. So this is going to turn into our nucleophile, but OH is not a very good nucleophile. If you remove that hydrogen, now you have um, an O minus, which is a really good nucleophile. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have this histidine 
help pull off that hydrogen to activate the serine. The aspartate is kind of going to help activate the histidine to help activate the serine. Um, and the binding is going to be um, determined by this specificity pocket. Um, so remember, it's not just these active site residues that are important. It's also the things around it and the surroundings and making this pocket to get the specificity. Um, so serine is going to come and it's going to cleave it. This N-terminal part is going to get stuck on, or sorry, is going to get released. The C-terminal part is stuck on in this covalent intermediate. So remember, covalent means they're sharing pairs of electrons. This is one of those stronger bonds. And now water is going to come, off, come in and help kick off the C-terminal part. Um, so with the cysteine protease and the threonine protease, they work similarly, but using cis or three. Um, and with cysteine protease is actually, um, so you don't need the triad. So this is a triad, you need all three of these. With cysteine proteases, you often just have like a diet or like a pair. But when you have a cysteine protease, um, you don't need the aspartate because um, cysteine, so it has that file group, which is more acidic. Um, so basically it'll give off, give up its H more, it'll give up its protein much e uh, more easily. And so you don't, like histidine is already okay to um, attack and pull that off. It doesn't need the help from the aspartate. So um, as we looked at the other day, for example, in the cysteine protease, um, MPRO of the coronavirus, you'll see this diode where you have the cysteine and the cysteine and the histidine is going to help activate the cysteine, um, but you don't have that triad. Um, but let's look at how the serine proteases do it with this triad. Um, so basically the histidine is going to have one of, uh, it's going to have um, one of its H pulled away by aspartate and that's going to make the histidine um, want to attack this to get a hydrogen. Um, and so it's gonna take it from the serine and give you this nucleophilic um, intermediate with on this oxygen. Um, at this point, your peptide um, is still fine, but serine is not happy. Um, and so serine is going to um, attack the carbonyl carbon. So remember we talked about how the oxygen was pulling away the electron density, making this um, carbon electrophilic. And this serine is a nucleophile, it's going to attack. Um, and this is going to um, give you this um, unstable tetrahedral intermediate. So you can see tetrahedral, this carbon is attached to four different things. Um, you have this negative charge, you have this awkward comp thing. Yeah, it's not happy. Um, when you have this intermediate, um, this unstable intermediate, um, it's going, there's like a part of the, the protein called like the oxy anion hole. Um, so this is like an oxy anion negatively charged oxygen. Um, and basically it's going to kind of help it break the right way. And so the nitrogen and what was the peptide bond is going to steal a proton from histidine and then bail. Um, and so you have this, um, this half leave as the, um, you have this part leave, um, but you have this part still covalently attached to the enzyme. And in order for it to be an enzyme, it needs to be able to do this over and over and over. It needs to be able to be reset at the end. And so we need to cut this off. Um, and to do that, we're going to use water. And so water is going to come in and it's going to be activated by the histidine, um, just like it activated the serine before. Now it's going to activate water. Um, and when it activates this water, now you have another nucleophile. Um, and what this nucleophile can do is it's going to attack the, car the carbonyl carbon. So when we still, we, now we have, another, we have that carbonyl carbon. Um, we have that same thing where it's electrophilic. We have a nucleophile. We're gonna get an attack, an unstable intermediate that'll get resolved and give you the release of the product and everything is reset, everything is happy. When you have this intermediate, um, this unstable, intermediate, um, it's going, there's like a part of the, the protein called like the oxy anion hole. Um, so this is like an oxy anion negatively charged oxygen. Um, and basically it's going to kind of help it break the right way. 
some common serine proteases are trypsin, hemotrypsin, and elastase. And you can see that they have different substrate preferences. So this is what they tend to cut next to. They like, so trypsin likes to cut next to lysine or arginine. Um, and by next to, I mean like C-terminal too. Um, Chymotrypsin likes to cut next to leucine, tyrosine, tryptophan, or phenylalanine, and elastase, serine, alanine, or glycine. And what you can tell by looking at these, um, what, looking at their substrate preferences, is that these substrate preferences, like these all are kind of similar. So these are long and negative, positively ch charged. These are bulky um, and hydrophobic. Um, these are nice and small. And so this fits with the like specificity of their site, remember the like the specificity pocket is going to be um, helping with the um, determining the substrate specificity. Um, we can inhibit this, however, using inhibitors like PMSF or phenylmethyl sulfonyl fluoride. Um, so basically, it looks like it's a peptide, um, kind of. Well. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to trick um, the serine protease um, to, but then get stuck on it. Um, and so the serine can attack um, the sulfur, um, but when it does that, it kicks off this hydrofluoric acid, but and now it's stuck on and this is not coming off. Um, the water can't make it come off. So what about other types of proteases? So aspartic proteases um, use aspartate to get water to do the protein cutting work for them. So before we looked at how the water, how with the serine um, protease, they activated water to get the second half released. With aspartic proteases, they use water from the very beginning. Um, and so they make water do all the work for them. Um, and so this um, basically they activate a water, the water attacks the carbonyl carbon, just like we saw before. Um, you get this um, carbonyl carbon overwhelmed, um, the breakage of the peptide bond. Um, unlike the serine protease, however, you never have the peptide covalently attacked to the protease. So instead inhibitors tend to work by reversible inhibition. Um, so basically they're not permanently stick, sticking, they're just um, like out competing the um the product so they're kind of just like mimicking the product but they can get um released um and so glutamic proteases are going to do similar but using glutamate metalloproteases do similar but with a metal ion so those are all activating water um so because we have these different types of proteases we have to add we make like a cocktail of different inhibitors. Um, so PMSF, as we discussed, is going to inhibit serine proteases irreversibly. Pepstatin um, is going to inhibit aspartic proteases reversibly. Um, lupeptin inhibits serine and cysteine proteases reversibly. Benzamidide, uh, benzamidine inhibits serine proteases reversibly. And aproteinin inhibits serine proteases reversibly. So you can also have serine and cysteine protease inhibitors that are um, reversible. You can also use um, a chelator like EDTA. So a chelator is something that like bites metals and like steals them. And so this will inhibit metalloproteases because it's not like directly impacting, like affecting them, binding them or anything, but stealing the metals that they need to work. So a lot of like the commercial, um, you can get like protease inhibitor cocktail tablets or whatever um, to use in your protein purification. If your protein needs metal, uh, don't use that because your protein needs metal. Um, or if you're gonna do like uh, nickel affinity. And so, yeah, so the SARS-CoV-2 MPRO um, is a cysteine protease. Um, and so it acts as a homodimer. So there's two identical copies of a protein chain paired up. And each of these has this active site. And so you can see here, this isn't the inhibitor, um, the Pfizer inhibitor, this is a different inhibitor, but you can see where this um, like active site is. It was in this active site, you have the histidine and the cysteine, which we talked about with the histidine helping activate the cysteine. Um, and the way that this inhibitor works, so you can see it kind of mimics a peptide substrate. You have this um, like peptide -y backbone. 
um, but it has this nitrile warhead, um, this here. What it's going to do is um, give you this thymoimidate adduct. Um, so basically this is going to get covalently stuck onto the enzyme. I'm stuck on into the active site of the MPRO, um, but it's unlike the, some other inhibitors, this is actually a reversible inhibition. So you can kind of think about it as you have it stuck in the active site, but it's not go undergoing any changes or anything that's going to make it less want to leave. Um, and so you have it in the active site um, where It'll, it prefers to be bound in the state, but it's also the enzyme catalyzes reactions in both directions. And so the enzyme can also catalyze like the reverse of this. So the reformation of the, like the breakage of the product basically, and, or the breakage of this like intermediate. And so because you have this happening, you can get this reversible inhibition where you can like basically dilute it out. If, but it's going to be stuck there a lot better than like typical non-covalent inhibitors um, that would only um, bind through like non-covalent bonds because this is actually covalently bound. And the rest of the molecule is, um, there's various reasons for having various different groups such as solubility and that sort of thing, but also making, giving it specificity. So giving it the features that'll allow it to help best bind into the active site of the enzyme and make, you can see it's making these other connections to different parts of the protein in addition to having this, um, this covalent bond.